Hello and welcome to the video version of the Happier at Work podcast, the award-winning podcast for people working in the talent space. Today's episode is all about workplace culture and I have an amazing conversation with Matt Phelan from the Happiness Index. We talk about all things culture, how now is really the time to use workplace culture as a competitive advantage. We talk about some of the challenges with that. We talk about going beyond just engagement metrics to really get to the heart of the feelings of people in an organisation in order to drive productivity, success, improved performance. We also talk about some of the fears associated with embarking on this type of work because I know for some people it can bring all sorts of reactions if the results are not what you thought they were. So we talk about things like that as well. We also talk about what the top drivers of happiness at work are according to the happiness index. I know you're really going to enjoy today's episode. Would love to know what you think. Leave a comment below. Let me know what action you're going to take as a result of listening to today's podcast. Matt Phelan of the Happiness Index, you're so welcome to the Happier at Work podcast. I know we've kind of had this in the works for for a good while now. Uh, We had a conversation probably a couple of years ago at this stage. So I'm really excited to dive in, to get stuck into this conversation, to talk about the Happiness Index. But before we get in there, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit about your background and how you got into doing what you're doing? Yeah, well, th- thanks for having us on. Um, it's surprising we haven't um, been able to do this, uh, considering how connected what we do is um, before. So it's great to be here. Um, so yeah, I'm Matt. I'm co-founder of the Happiness Index. So we measure how people think and feel about work um, in over 100 countries. So we use that data to help companies improve the culture um, and the workplaces that they work in. So. Yeah, in a in a nutshell, it's a we're, we're a sort of a competitor to the traditional employee engagement metrics that can be a bit cold um, and not necessarily always get deep into the truth. So that yeah, the happiness index sort of goes a bit deeper than your your traditional tools is how we we, we would describe it. Mm. And how did you get into doing that in the first place? Like, what sort of prompted this? How did it all come about? So I was um, I was working in data, but from a customer perspective, so. Mm-hmm. Before the happiness index, we, I'd, I'd quit a job because I was unhappy, um, and I didn't really have any options. So I started my own company uh, with one of my best friends, and it was it was good and bad timing because it was a few weeks, few months before the two thousand and eight financial crisis, mm-hmm. um, which you could look on the surface thing as a bad thing, but when you're starting out, when big change happens, the marbles sort of get chucked up in the air. And it was a time when things like Google, Facebook were still relatively new. So we we helped like marketers understand how data can make the marketing more efficient, better and more creative. And they have a saying in marketing that's, that is relevant to this conversation, which is 50% of my marketing works. I just don't know what 50%. Yeah. Um, it's a John Wanamaker quote um, from like 1880 or something like that. But that world was being revolutionized. But then when I started growing our own business, I realized the data on culture doesn't really exist. Mm. It kind of just comes down to what people say it is or what they think or um, or who, who the most highest paid person in the room thinks about it. So we built internally a tool just to understand if our employees are happier, are our customers happier? So that's all we were doing in the early days. And then our customers kept asking for it. Like our marketing customers were saying, oh, we could really use that in our company. Mm. <laughs> and uh, we were saying, no, you can't, you can't use it. It's an internal tool. It's terrible. It's like put together with Blue Tack. Um, yeah, yeah. I, can you, I can send you the screenshots. I've, I've used them before. They, they look horrific. But it was doing what we wanted to do it functionally. Um, and then eventually I sort of realized my passion, my skill was like data and tech, mm. but my passion culture and people so I realized I wasn't necessarily enjoying what I was doing and when we had this early piece of tech I felt like that's what I want to do <laughs> um so we sold that company um for, for for a good valuation and then we reinvested our time and money into the happiness index so it's given us a lot of creative freedom because um we've not had to like answer to VCs and so on so mm. we can 
right to build rather than what is the like buzz like the buzzword thing that yeah. is around that particular time so it's put us on a really our, we call our vision is freedom to be human and it's about allowing everyone to be themselves at work to thrive and so on but it means we don't deviate from that path because we don't have like a big vc saying you need to do this we need to do that to so it allows us to have that long-term approach so mm. that's a really quick fire around the, the history of that <laughs> yeah but it's really interesting i think that and you know lots of similarities in our own backgrounds i think as well i came from that agency marketing agency market research data heavy big into data kind of background as well and similar to yourself matt i found myself more in, interest in the data, but more passionate about the people and culture and how to use data to to kind of get the most and, and make connections in in that realm rather than like, as I always kind of look back at it quite, um, you know, flippant remark, but like helping, helping helping big companies get bigger, basically helping yeah. helping them sell more of their products to to customers, which is not something that really lights me up. Um, exactly. But so let's let's kind of dive into the happiness index and, and, you know, whether you take us on a journey or whether you take us like this is where we are now. But what kind of things did you start looking at if you're saying, OK, so what I found was there's a link between how happy my employees are and how happy my customers are. Brilliant. That's great. But how do you then say, well, how do we measure that happiness of the employees? Yeah. What kinds of things do you look at? Well, the, the easy thing is correlation um the difficult bit is causation yes um, and and how how for those that, that that are not data people listening in obviously correlation you can get lots of things that correlate but don't cause each other so there's loads of classic examples of yeah. like <laughs> rain and umbrellas and like what causes what and so on so yeah. it's it, the first bit we were just trying to understand we we're just trying to get to the basics when the people are happier are people happy? Are the customers happy? So we, at that stage, we were just happy with correlation because it, it isn't something that we were trying to bring to other companies. Mm -hmm. It was just uh, sort of like what you'd say, like a sense check, like like a temperature check is probably what we were using it for. So yeah. we weren't trying to be scientific about it. But then when we realized, okay, we might make this commercial project, we had to look into things like neuroscience to really understand like what motivates people. Mm -hmm. And that's where the two worlds of sort of like, data and tech combined with neuroscience so we started to try and understand like what drives happiness what are the top drivers of it um and you also encounter some issues when you get there so if you take the longest study into happiness um which is an american study i think it's about 80 years long it's a great study it's well known uh, every week someone messaged me and said have you seen this study it's brilliant the, it, it is, <laughs> brilliant. It's pretty as if you haven't seen it already yeah, it's a really useful study because it's the longest study in happiness. Yeah. However, all the subjects in the study are male. Yeah. So therefore, what, what, what you've got is a study of male happiness. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, encounter, uh, you encounter a lot of these issues. So what we were trying to do is understand global happiness. Like mm -hmm. what, what are the unifiers? Like what, what, what drives someone in india in japan in the uk are they different and so on and and so yes there are huge cultural differences but there are also universal things that are coded into us um that drive us all so to give you an example the top drive of happiness in 100 countries that we work in is positive relationships mm. so that's not a cultural thing um it may skew more in one country than the other but it still that still comes out number one mm. but then the the environment might change what comes up next so if you, let's take a couple of countries as an example that 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 are geographically relatable um but very different so if you take usa and canada in um canada acknowledgement comes up number two mm. Um, in our data set, whereas clarity comes up number two in the USA for US employees. Now, no one, including us, knows 100% why that is, but you, what it does is it creates conversations. So my, my, my view on it is it, a lot of it comes down to things like healthcare, because I'm a father. If I worked in a US business and I knew that if I lost my job, my children lost their childcare, I'd probably be asking my boss 25 times a day, am I doing a good job? 
yeah i'll be i'll be really checking in on clarity i'll be like am i doing the thing that you need me to do yeah yeah, um, yeah. which I, I think probably happening at a subconscious a conscious and a subconscious level but let's take canada where they they have something more similar to what we have in the U, in the uk which is like an nhs which means if you lose your job you still have like decent access to mm -hmm. maybe that allows that sort of like the hierarchy of needs to rise so mm -hmm. something like acknowledgement goes up higher um but all of the global trends are obviously fascinating and they're great to talk about on a podcast but where it gets really exciting is when a company does it for their own um organization but do you, the question i always ask everyone do you have a twin at all that you haven't told me about do I, do I have a twin? Yeah, do you have a twin? Not that I'm aware <laughs> of. No. I felt like you, the, the way um, you, you were looking at me like I was about to reveal that you had a twin and you didn't know and this twin was going to come on to the show. But <laughs> some of the some of the best studies into this area is in twins. Okay. So if you get two twins, anyone who's listening is, who's a twin, anyone who knows twins, knows that even if they're identical twins, and they, they will still have different personalities. Yeah. What that and that where that research is really powerful what that reminds us is if twins are, if identical twins are different therefore every individual is different therefore every team is different therefore every company is different yeah so you get the top level learnings but then when you deploy it inside a company what you find um is always a surprise i've never worked with a company in the last 10 years that got their beta data back and wasn't surprised there's always okay. stuff yeah really i didn't know that yes <laughs> so on a global level it's you can sort of generalize and say well this in this country it's this kind of order this hierarchy whereas when you're looking at an individual company because individuals are unique everyone is different it's really hard to know in advance, well, what is that going to look like? And, exactly. and I suppose I'd love to explore a little bit more being the data nerd that I am. How do you look at that? Like, is that more on an individual basis? Is it a team basis? Is it overall for the company? And then kind of building on that, what are the big challenges? Are there any themes across different companies that you're seeing yeah. that are coming through? Yeah, this huge theme. So the, the first thing clients do is they, they take what we call the cultural assessment. Mm. It's the equivalent in medical terms of sort of going in for your BUPA test where they, they measure everything. So we measure that just to get a read of, of where you are on your journey, because there's no judgment here. Some people have terrible cultures. Some people have great cultures. Mm. It doesn't really matter. It, it, what's important is, are you going to try and improve it? Um, but before you can improve it, um, you need to know where to start. So we we do the cultural assessment just to get a bit of a feel of where you are. Then when we've got that, that's when you can then like focus in and say, OK, going back to your point, psychological safety is low in this company. Let's put a program in place to start to improve that. And then um, you track it again to see how it's working. And it's so it's it's a it's a game of continual improvement but we always one of the things that happens with the happiness index we get a bit typecast is people in their head although we call the happiness index in their head they think that we're the high happiness index so they make an assumption that we are only advocating for high levels of happiness which ultimately is great like we want people to be happy and so on but what it really is is the it's the data behind emotions that help you understand and create cultural intelli cultural intelligence in your organization on the stuff that you need to improve. So we are not advocates for what we, we would call like toxic positivity, where you're like forcing everyone yeah. to be happy all the time. What we're trying to do is understand like the drivers of what's motivating people and not motivating people so you can improve the culture. Mm. Um, and it, we always make that distinction because some people think like we're, that, we're like hippies that are going to just be saying like everyone has to be happy all the time yeah yeah um, but it's not let's the get case. around in a circle and start singing and yeah yeah which is if you want to do that there's not i've got no <laughs> issue with that but what we do is you can learn as much from what is making people unhappy in your organization as what makes them happy and um, and both are data is is key so I, I say to everyone emotions are data points stop trying to like label them as positive or negative 
and just go, your body, your brain is communicating with you. Are you prepared to listen to it? Now, all the happiness index does is does that on scale. It's doing it with companies of 100 employees up to 400,000. Um, so when you're a CEO, you're getting all that data in and we're organizing it for them. But on an individual level, that's all it's doing. If, if, you, if you go to work every day and you feel fear, your body's telling you something. And mm. it's, it, it's an opportunity to investigate and understand. Now, there's a hundred reasons why you might be feel, feel, feeling fearful. You might have a, a manager that's bullying you, but maybe you just feel uncomfortable in that environment because it's not inclusive. Or maybe, maybe you haven't got the training that you need and you need to go and speak to someone and they'll go, oh, great. Yeah, no, we'll get you some training on that. It's not a problem. <laughs> but it's, it's a data point, isn't it? Like, right. And so rather than thinking of emotions as like, let's take anger, rather than thinking of it as a bad thing, like why do, try and understand, help people understand why do I feel angry um, and how can I, how can I use that data? And do people use that on an individual basis or is it kind of, is it more for managers or a company or is it all three? I think it's all, it's all three. I think okay. if you think of it from a CEO, CEO level, if you've got less than 100 employees, you generally know most people's names and you can walk mm. around and speak to most people. Yeah. Once you start getting above like the Dunbar number, which is like 120, where, where tribes and groups start to break down, it's really difficult to have emotional intelligence and get, get a feel for how everyone's feeling in the organization. So the CEO is using it for the top level because if you're about to go and do a big presentation, you kind of need to know how everyone's feeling mm. um, because that's so you don't come across as tone deaf. So that's the top level. The middle level is like managers using it to improve their teams, mm. right? You find out, okay, this manager, me, um, I know I'm bad at this. Um, I, I can be quite bad at offering clarity for teams that I work in. Um, and it's something I have to work at. So let's say I get my data back and it says that, then I'm like, right, okay, that's what I need to improve. So the man so it empowers the managers. Um, but then on an individual level, um, reflecting it on yourself, it has to be two ways as well, because one of the first things that we do, and I put, put it all, in all my talks is you can't make any of your employees happy. Mm. You can't make your wife happy. You can't make your husband happy. You can't make your children happy. You can't make yourself happy. What you can do is create the right environment and be in the right environment. And because it's a two way street, like, your company can provide all the things that drive happiness. We've touched on a few of them, psychological safety, um, feelings of acknowledgement, freedom to take opportunities. They can provide all of those. It still doesn't mean you'll be happy. Um, so it is a two way street of the individual also um, trying to understand like what's working for them and what they need. So it, I think personally, it, it starts the process of people knowing each other a lot better. So it's kind of almost a conversation opener, like these are the kinds of things um, that are working for me at the moment. These are the kinds of things that are not working for me. So let's take acknowledgement as an example. You were saying that that's, um, that's quite high in Canada generally, but let's say like a lot of people have this need to be acknowledged, to feel seen, to feel heard, to feel understood in their workplace, and then they can yep see from the data that that's something that's not happening for them on an individual basis and then use that language to have a conversation and see what can change that's it that's exactly it and so like let's let's do i'll just do, do an example of what i did with my team recently so we yeah. plotted we, we just wrote on a board this is you don't even know anyone everyone listening they, they don't need to happen they don't need to work with happiness and it's to do this but I, we'll, let's do it together so the top four drivers of happiness are safety relationships freedom and acknowledgement now i notice you've written them down right i'm just going to ask you to rank the number one for you what would you what would you say the number one is for you personally um that's interesting because i probably would have said freedom and then you said acknowledgement acknowledgement i think is really high for me recognition yeah. that kind of thing yeah so that's if we're, let's say we're co-CEOs of this new happiness business, I need to know that yeah. because I might not, I, you, it's, it's, it's been such a simple process. I didn't yeah. know that before we started this call, but I now know that. So, yeah. um, and I know, I know, I know, and I've had that feedback from one of my team members. Sometimes I can forget on that element because startups and tech is so fast paced. 
I like I have to mentally practice to stop mm. mid project and mid to acknowledge how far we've progressed. Yes. Because I'm always on to the next thing. Oh, I'm so, exactly but, the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. You're on to the next thing before the the first thing is even you're thinking ahead of what's what's going to be happening next. Yeah. So <laughs> anyone who's listening, do that with your team, like your six, seven people and do it as a project together. Uh, you, and you need a pen and a piece of paper or yeah. you can do it on a Zoom call. And it just you just get to know the people around you like and this is why I think styles and managers adapting is really important because let's take a couple of other points that come lower down. Let's take, so my, my one is freedom, right? Mm. And that's the top driver for me, but let's take, let's compare freedom and clarity. I've got two people in my team, one who says freedom is number one and one who says clarity is number one. Yeah. Now the one who wants, who says freedom, they really want to, they want to know from me once a month, what they want, what I need from them and what they need from me. They yeah. want to go off and when they need me, they'll come back to me. Mm. The clarity one wants to meet with me regularly to check in the, 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 the progress they're making is in the mm. right direction. Yeah. Now, if I manage them both in the same way, the one who wants freedom would think I was a micromanager. Yeah. And the one who, think, who wants clarity would think I didn't care. Yeah. So again, and, and that's where like, like, regression to the averages or regression to the mean or whatever you want to call it can be dangerous because actually if i found a midway of managing them both they'd probably both not be happy yes so yeah, yeah i actually need to adapt what they need from me so mm. all it is all these things are is they're just models for for people to better understand each other and the better we understand each other in our teams um that's how you improve happiness which is why it's not a bad thing to find out that you're not fulfilling your team's uh, needs because you know the flip of that is never to know and then people resign people are unhappy people get disengaged so yeah the data is just it's just awareness that's all it is mm. and are people sort of afraid of finding out like are they kind of would they prefer to live under a rock and not know <laughs> rather than acknowledge that they've been doing something maybe that's not been too beneficial or that they could improve in some way this this is where you're going with this is probably the biggest elephant in the room of the whole subject mm -hmm. because there are people that want to know yeah um, but there are people who don't want to know and yeah. that's that's really challenging because the happiness index goes deeper than 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 what you would with a normal engagement tool so some people are happy with their spreadsheet saying everything is green everything's going up um and all is rosy when you get on the ground you speak to people you know it's not but okay. yeah, yeah. I think if, if I'm being kind, um, I think a lot of it comes from fear. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and it's the fear of having to all like CEOs thinking they have to have the answer to everything. CEOs not feeling comfortable being vulnerable. CEOs not being comfortable standing up going, you know what, we failed on this. Hmm. But we're going to fix it. Or we failed on this. We can't actually fix this because this is um, what happened that this is an impossible thing for us to fix, but this is a different route we're going to go. Like the one of the things that I say to CEOs a lot on this subject, I, I always ask them a rhetorical question, which is, do you um, do you break child labor laws? <laughs> and then I just let them think on that one. Yeah. Um, and then hopefully 100% of the time they're, they're going to say, no, we do not break child labor laws. Yeah. The reason I ask that is because every everything that the ceo is worried about acknowledging all your employees are already dealing with at home the budget yeah comms issues people falling out mental health issues burnout the kitchen all everything from small to big everyone that works for you is an adult mm. so they're already dealing with these issues so if you stand up and you are authentic and you say look no We've, we've missed target on this. We're not doing that. We're not doing well here. This is where we want to improve. This is what I need from everyone. People get it. What, yeah. When you stand up and you say everything's all right, but they know it's not all right. You're just, you're just, you're just that to, to the person who's receiving it. They're just thinking you are totally out of touch with what's happening in this yeah, organization. Yeah, yeah. That takes away the trust completely. It completely erodes the trust because they're not being authentic. They're not being honest. Yeah. And the second thing that happens, so firstly, people fear finding out. Mm. So you're right, that does happen, which is the subject we just discussed. 
the second thing that happens is people find out that things are not great and then they fear if we tell people that they're not great ah uh, okay that it all that that will be a bad idea but I, yeah i like to explain to people but they're the people that told you it's not great <laughs> so they know already <laughs> they already know <laughs> yes <laughs> They're the ones who told you. They know. Yeah. They're the ones that told you. All you're doing is acknowledging it. And and interestingly, just acknowledging it actually improves happiness. Okay. So that, obviously you then need to go on to action and you need to do something about it. But sometimes employees are just frustrated because they feel like leadership are not acknowledging what's going on in the organization. So the first bit, first bit is people are fearful of finding out. Second, there some people want to bury it. Um, mm. But when you get can get someone one on one and can do it this in an interesting light, just just to remind people they already know and say it to them in yeah. plain simple terms, then they go, oh yeah, 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 and it's like, and you can move you can move forward because if you if you rule out like the really bad like incompetent CEOs that maybe just shouldn't be in the job, most CEOs are trying to do a really good job. They just yeah. They're just not sure where to go and they don't necessarily have the right people to speak to. So, and that's where data comes in. It helps, helps lighten up the path. Yeah. There's a, there's a couple of things that I'm kind of, I suppose, relating to in what you're saying is these kinds of things, while you applied in the workplace, actually it could be applied at home as well. Mm. The acknowledgement, the clarity, you know, setting clear expectations, all of that kind of stuff. You can apply it in probably multiple different contexts, not just we just happen to be talking about applying it in the workplace. Yeah, I think this is the the, the, the main thing I can't prove from our data, but it's probably the area that I'm I'm increasingly more passionate about. I what, what you've just said there, I wholeheartedly believe mm. I, we again, because we're we're into the research and the data, I can't prove that. Um, but I do know that my wife constantly says, um, how come all this stuff that you do at work, you're not great at, at home. So mm. I know it's important and I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure these employees that we call employees who, who are actually really human beings, it does apply at, at home. And, th and that's one thing I always tell people to go away and think about how could yeah. you apply this at home? But yeah. I'm pretty sure it's the same in every family, every mm. friendship group, um, every sports club. Um, and like I say, like I, I don't want to make statements without data because I haven't personally researched that. But it, I've written a couple of books on the subject. Probably if I wanted to write another one, which I'm not sure I do, it would be for children. OK, yeah, um, because I think uh, I think actually a lot of the stuff that we're uncovering and, and, and looking at should be taught in schools mm -hmm. um, at a basic level. Like you think about how AI is going to revolutionize the workplace memorizing your alphabet how, how is it more important to do that or is it more important to understand how mental health works as an example yeah brilliant can we come back to this idea of it doesn't have to be high happiness and it's not happiness for happiness sake and it's not all toxic positivity and you mentioned that there are some people come to you and actually the culture is not in a great shape and yeah. then there's probably the people who are not listening to this podcast who are not interested in their culture whatsoever, yeah. even if it's in a terrible shape. So talk yeah. to me a little bit about the people who come to you when they they know their culture needs to be improved and they want to do something about it. What kind of things are going through their minds? So it is again to use the medical um, analogy where like the first thing is the Booper test, like the culture yeah. assessment. Mm. Most people come to us with symptoms. OK. Most people don't come to us and say, I want a happy workforce. Yes. I yeah, wish yeah. that was the case. And that yeah. is in like work by you, your podcast. We're a small community, really. Um, everyone kind of knows everyone. But I do think that that is changing it slightly. Like more people are doing that. But generally, people come to us and say, my metrics, my engagement metrics say everything's fine. But okay. I know. I've I'm having conversations with people and everyone's saying they hate it working here and they can't they can't do this and we can see in the attrition numbers or we're losing all our account management stuff and our customers are unhappy there's normally a symptom yeah and they come to us with a symptom and we say okay. well let's do let's do the check first let's do yeah. it let's not make any assumptions that's why I always say everyone's kind of surprised because people will come at it with the the, the sad reality is 
the higher you are up in an organization, the more your employees lie to you. And I mean that in the yeah. nicest possible yeah. light because there's a power dynamic in place that you pay their wages and at the stroke of a, a keyboard, you could put them into some process that means they lose their job. Yeah. Not, not saying whether that's right or wrong, but that mm. power structure exists. So it means it's hard to actually really get a feel for how your people feel. Um, but but people have got the guts and guts are as important. They're an important part of data and we, we include that in our work as well. And so a lot of people, and they'll be listening to this and be like, yes, yeah, something's just not right. And then, then then they'll come to us. And then the bit that we've really focused on the last, the, this year and so on is how you then help turn that into performance. Yeah. Because when we started out, it was simply measure, but now it's around how do you look after your people? How do you create a great environment where they can perform and how mm. does it link to performance? Because ultimately, um, that's where companies want to go. They still want the organization to perform. So we that's where we spend a lot of our a lot of our work. Yeah. Um, but the starting point is just to find out where you are on the journey. Yeah. I think it's interesting and it goes back to the earlier point that you mentioned about the happiness index. It goes deeper than a uh, typical engagement survey. There are the, the kind of standard engagement questions, uh, Europe based or USA based, depending on, on which ones that you're familiar with. But it's interesting that they're not revealing the kinds of things that the happiness index is revealing. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's part of part of what you see in studies and research is because a lot of the studies and research are based on um, psychology and make the assumption that um, human beings are rational. Yeah, yeah. We don't make the assumption that human beings are rational. We we make the assumption that being rational is part of a human being, but our emotions, our instincts and our reflective brain, which is in the prefrontal cortex, all play a huge part. Yeah. And also they can contradict each other, Yeah. which people don't like to admit that, but how you think about it, something, I'll just, I'll let everyone think on this one, but how you think about something can be different to how you feel about something. Mm. So an example of that could be I think I've got a good job. It's got a good salary. It's got a good location. Um, it's it's a well-respected industry and people respect my job title. Yeah. But you can feel at the same time deeply unhappy. Yeah. Um, and I feel like I'm not living out my life's purpose and mm. I don't feel like that I'm acknowledged here. So that's that can, that can confuse companies because they like to think everyone's rational. Yeah. But we're not. We're not and human beings and some of the biggest life decisions that we will make don't make a rational decision. Mm. Everything from buying a car to where we work to who we marry is not a wholly rational uh, decision. Yeah. Um, and work and business, we ignore that. We, we ignore the fact that emotions are incredibly important and we, we block them out and pretend that they're unprofessional. There could even be some conflict there because I'm thinking I have this amazing job and other people would love this job. Why do I not feel the way I should about the job? So there's kind of almost a conflict between what I think I should feel about my job and how I actually feel about my job. 100%. And that is that is why we say think of your emotions as data points. That it's, it's your body, it's your soul, it's, it's talking to you. Yeah. Think about the accountant that went to university, whose parents are really proud they're an accountant. They've got a good salary, which means they've got the best apartment in town. But actually, they really enjoy art. Mm -hmm. And that's what they want to be doing. Like th these conflicts sit there all the time. Where, where I think smart businesses work this out. So one of the main reasons in our data set, because we, we, we tr track the whole employee experience. So we, um, we can look at um, exit data people generally are leaving where they don't feel they're progressing. Yeah. But mm. that's where I think really great companies do the work, which is progression plans for everyone, understand where they need to go. Yeah. And a lot of companies resist that because they go, oh, well, it's a bit like a pyramid here. There's only so many senior roles you can move to. Most employees, when you look at the data, they're not, move, they're not they don't have an issue with wage and seniority levels. Yeah, They're, our, our brains are always looking for growth opportunities to yeah, learn for challenge. So, yeah, yeah, all those things. And companies are really bad at helping employees navigate. I, I, I always say to Gemma, our 
um, chief people officer, if we can't if we can't show someone here their progression plan, it's a lack of creativity on our side. Yeah, because we're a fast growing business that's working in like neuroscience data, like the cutting edge of human being. Like if if we can't find that, that's our that's our problem. Mm -hmm. Like there's new opportunities all the time. Um, and and if someone can't see it, it's because we it's our create it's our lack of creativity that we haven't shown them that. Yeah, I think I think it works both ways. So I think the organization has a responsibility to provide those opportunities and make it really clear to people how to progress. Um, yeah. But equally, they need to put the onus on the individual to seek out what those opportunities are, to uncover for themselves, to spark those conversations with their manager if their manager is not having those conversations. So I think it, it I think I both sides need to have responsibility yeah. on that so that you know, and, and an individual employee should never feel that they can't progress. Like I know that I've left several organizations because I did, I didn't see a path forward. I didn't see yeah. an opportunity for me to progress and I wasn't happy. I wasn't feeling challenged enough where I was. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, so I can absolutely relate to that. But now that I know what I know, it's like, how could I have carved out that opportunity for myself? How could I have sparked those conversations with my managers at the time to see what that path might actually look like in front of me? Yep. No, I 100% agree. And, and that, and that go, it goes back to the point, you can't make your employees happy. It's a two way mm. street. Like both yeah. sides need to do the work. But I still think the onus is on the company to make it clear yes. that we are open to having that conversation. Yeah. Is in some organisations it's not. It's a closed down conversation. Yeah. Where there's, where there's certain times like, of the year that it happens. It's through a competitive process. All of these kinds of things. Yeah. 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 It's, it's maybe you're undermining, undermining your undermining. It's seen as undermining your manager. Seen yeah. as being above your station. All these things. Like. Yeah. You should always be open to the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Especially for someone who wants to take that next step, who's really keen to progress. Yeah. So, so, like me, I've always been super ambitious. Yeah. Um, Matt, I'd love to explore before we wrap things up, like what are some of the key things that you're seeing in companies now that are adding to employee happiness and detracting? Are there some specific trends that you're seeing? I think there's a real battle of going on in organizations at the moment mm. and the, the one thing I, I would encourage people to do if they've not read it or to reread it is to to reread 1984 okay <laughs> yeah. because there is a real we're at a crossroads with technology mm. and i think technology could at the moment be the thing that frees us and allows employees to be no matter what industry you're in be creative because i don't buy into this if you were good at art drama or music at school that you're creative and if you were good at maths you're not creative yeah. every single human being is creative in their own way and it's what's going to differentiate us from machines and robots mm. everyone wants to, to unlock that and be used for that um however um we're in a situation where people are using technology for for example control monitoring how many hours people sit at their desks monitoring how long someone's on a google teams like monitoring yeah. keystrokes there's there's that side of it where people have this this i think warped view of 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 what performance and productivity means because it in your head like tech desk time at desk it doesn't matter whether you're at home or at uh, or, or in an office let's not get into that debate but that is not i've not seen any research that shows that that is what um leads to productivity creativity and and, yeah. and the right outputs so yeah and that's think, a whole other podcast episode as well it's another podcast episode but to, to answer your question i think the world has moved on you mm. can't change the fact the world has moved on but what's detracting from happiness at the moment some companies are really holding on to that control yeah Whereas the organizations that are going, you know what, the world has changed. Let's let's create freedom here. Let's unlock the potential of our employees. They are reaping the rewards because at the end of the day, business is a talent game. Hmm. If you've got the best talent on your team, nine times out of 10, you're going to win. Um, and 
the best talent is going to be able to choose. So where do you think the best talent is going to choose to be? The place that controls them um, and tracks their mouse strokes yeah. or the company that is trying to understand their needs and what they need to be motivated at work like i don't even need to answer that question for mm. your your listeners so i think what's detracting is companies are trying to hold on to the past and i and, and i can also understand that on an intellectual level it comes from a place of fear when people are under pressure they go back to what they know best if your experience has been leading that way that's what you'll lean on um but there's a whole group of new leaders new managers that are looking at the world differently and they are reaping the rewards of the talent coming their way um so I think Darwin will will play a role in this. I think the companies that don't get it will slowly die out, die out of time, mm. um, die out over time. Unfortunately, that the collateral damage of that is all our friends and family that we all know that are working in those organisations. That it's not great. Um, so I think ultimately, to answer your question, the companies that are looking to the future and thinking, how do I unlock the potential of my employees? They're doing great work and. I would say to my friends, go and look at our client list. That's a place to go and apply for a job. Because people yeah. were like, oh, because everyone, because because of our company name, everyone was like, oh, I'd love to come and work at the Happiness Index. But I remind them that not everyone at the Happiness Index is happy, including myself. Like it's, a, it, we're all a work in progress. Yeah. But I say, you know what? We can't employ everyone, but um, go and look at our client list because yeah. generally people won't be listening to this podcast or working with the Happiness Index or working with you if they don't care. So yeah. we, we our brands filter them out they, yeah. they they're just we're we're fluffy hippies so they don't even come to this podcast <laughs> so you don't even need to worry about offending them exactly exactly um so yeah i would say that it's just it's, a, it's just a brilliant opportunity to attract the best people and win over your competition right now it's the best opportunity anyone's going to have over the next few years to build build that culture that people want to be in yeah brilliant love that and matt the question i ask everyone who comes on the podcast what does being happier at work mean to you to me, um, it is being a good dad and being a good CEO. I wouldn't want either to be out of kilter. Like yeah. both are important to me. My career um, is important to me. Doing good work and learning is important to me. Being a dad is my number one priority. So I don't want it to get out of kilter. I know there's lots of debates around what what's balanced, what's not. For me, like they're my two jobs, and I want to do them. I want them both to be able to work together, yeah. but not um, not um, feel like I'm sacrificing in every area. So, yeah. that for me, if I if I can do that, I'll I feel I will feel successful. That's yeah. my that's so my not at odds with each other, more integration. And yeah. yeah, I mean this term balance, everyone uses that. It's so common. But on the podcast, I've talked about other words that we can use instead, like whether it's yeah. integration blend is, blend or, is or blend, yeah, harmony. All of these things, rather than like harmony. trying to get that sense of balance, is yeah, yeah, it's really tough. I think harmony is probably the best word that describes what I feel. Yeah, brilliant. And if people want to find out more about the Happiness Index, if they want to find out about more about you, want to reach out and connect with you, what's the best place that they can do that? Yeah, so if you're looking to speak to me, book me for a speaker or, or podcast or whatever, um, get, just connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, if you're looking to get a demo go to the happinessindex.com and, and and the team will help but feel free to send me messages questions pe people do every day and I, tr I, tr I get i try and get back to every single person that's not a cold sales message brilliant and i know you have a podcast as well if you want to give a shout out to your podcast since people are listening to this podcast they might enjoy your own yeah well. so uh, yeah that's a good point we should probably got a good crossover which we're, we're at, I'm about to have a guest on that your listeners might know <laughs> uh, I might be speaking to you right now, but um, if you head over to Happiness in Humans, you, it's a mix of like researchers, data people, and and, and our customers. Um, but um, yeah, come and have a come and have a listen. I, I think if you enjoy this podcast, you'll enjoy that one. Brilliant! Thank you so much for your time today, Matt. Really, really enjoyed this conversation. Loads of nuggets, loads of practical things that I think people can start doing straight away. I particularly liked the, you know, name those top drivers and whether or not they're being realized, I suppose, at the moment. And people can just do that with a paper and pen, as you said. So really appreciate your time yeah. today. Thank you.
thanks for having me on and, and keep up all that work that you're doing it's it's, it's really helping that the the wider i don't like calling it an industry but like the wider movement um to, movement to, to i think is a good word yeah yeah i love that yeah thank you so much thank you